Okay, without further ado, I'm really pleased to introduce uh, uh, Dr. George Utz. And, you know, uh, we had, when we were discussing different keynotes, we really wanted someone who could give a broad perspective, both on uh, arachnology here, plus had been involved in really, truly a broad range of work. Uh, before I say anything else, how many of you were George's, raise your hands or may, maybe stand up. How many of you were George's students at one point or another? <laughs> Wait, how many of you were men, in addition, how many of you were mentored by George at di in different areas of research? Yeah, I mean, this is a, a decent portion of this audience, and it's, it's really so. So George is going to talk about history. He was just telling me he was at the meeting where it was decided that really we needed to start an American arachnology society. Um, and... George has worked in, in broad areas. He's going to talk about it, but he, he's been particularly influential in two areas. First, in the one that I care the most about, which is in spider sociality. And basically, people knew about stegodyphus and analosmus being social spiders. Huh? <laughs> they did not. <laughs> okay. Anyway, he was looking at spiders that were different. The colonial spiders are really, really different than the other social spiders. And they do different things and do interesting things. And he really took off with the unusual uh, social spiders. In addition, his work and that of his students on different aspects of wolf spider courtship have really changed how everybody is approaching studies of sexuality and especially multimodal uh, uh, studies of um, courtship, whatever. So anyway, um, I could go on and on but I am terrifically pleased to introduce uh, one of my mentors, Dr. George Oates. Thank you. A little while. Uh, it's been a minute, as they say. It sort of feels like that sometime. And uh, <clears throat> the first thing you got to do, of course, is you want to share insights gained from a long-term research career. And, and <clears throat> of course, it doesn't hurt that you're possessed of some embarrassing old photos uh, that uh, you can tell some stories about. Um, I'm going to cover some current and unpublished material because I am still doing research, even though I'm coming to the end of my career next year. I... Uh, I, I still have stuff that I want to publish, and I want to see how well this flies with uh, this audience. Um, I, I will comment on not only the state of the field, but the history, having been there since the beginning, and, uh, and look at some long-term trends, and uh, of course, give advice to young people starting their career, which is about half the audience. So that's my opportunity to pontificate on what I think is important. Um, if you ask a lot of people in this audience, why do you study spiders? What, how did you become an arachnologist? And, and, and the answer uh, is quite often, they've had a lifelong fascination with spiders and they really have always thought they were interesting. This is not the case with me. Uh, <clears throat> I found this cartoon uh, that absolutely captures the moment at which my arachnophobia began. Uh, I was... Uh, I was a kid, maybe six or seven, and I was playing what is now a politically incorrect game of, of uh, cowboys and Indians. Uh, and um, uh, I was sneaking around a corner uh, with my cap gun to shoot one of my neighbor kids. And I put my hand down on the bottom of a rain spout and a spider ran up my arm and that was it, man. I just, that was, 
That was serious arachnophobia. In fact, this is seared in my memory. Not only did this just capture the moment when it happened, but it is seared in my memory so well that I can identify the spider. That's not an Arrhenius marmorius, but that was the one who ran up my arm and scared me to death. And that arachnophobia persisted until I went to college uh, when I had my life changed by by two great mentors, Dean, Dean Dillery and Alan Brady. I went to Albion College in Michigan and um, uh, I took a course in invertebrates from Dillery and a course in arthropods from Brady, who was a visiting professor. And I was hooked. That was where my uh, fascination with, with spiders began. And um, this um, is a page from my first publication with Dean Dillery. Uh, somehow these two guys, through their influence, turned this, um, this fraternity bro uh, into a scientist, which I think is a remarkable achievement for them. In any case, I went on from there to study entomology at the University of Delaware, uh, where first came the mustache and then the beard and, uh, and Earth Day, which is a, even more of an inspiration to study not only spiders, but in the ecological context, because I was very caught up with the environmental movement. And then I went to Illinois for my PhD, uh, studying floodplain spiders uh, and, uh, and leaf litter. In fact, my, my doctoral thesis work was all about <clears throat> the community ecology of leaf litter spiders and how the structure of leaf litter and the depth of leaf litter uh, affected the, uh, the number of species and the species diversity. I remember presenting this first at, at the arachnology meetings <laughs> where I'm using species diversity in indices. And it was the first time uh, a lot of arachnologists had any idea, what I, or no idea what I was talking about. And it was pretty fun. But what I did find in, in that work, uh, and I got to publish a number of papers from my thesis, has to do with the influence of the structure of litter, its depth and its complexity uh, on not only the, the number of species, but, but the families and the composition of the community. And this upper graph here is a natural transition in leaf litter structure caused by floodplain. Down here, it floods and flattens, and up here, it's untouched. And uh, the other one is a, uh, a, a, a set of experimental plots where we raked leaves and piled them up and took them away. And what you see in both of those cases is a decline in the number of lycosids and an increase in the diversity of other families of spiders. So this was the beginning of my research career. And uh, of course, I'll mention some of this later. You know, these were, I thought these were good things to work on, but apparently, there are trends in science and this studying diversity and community composition became passe. Uh, lucky for me, I moved on to the University of Cincinnati and I put some of these pictures in here at, for the benefit of my students who always like to look at the hair transition. Uh, and particularly this, uh, uh, this one, whoops, sorry, back, back, back. Um, this, this, this one, which is uh, my, my students call this my Bob Ross face. <clears throat> Where, where I, I'm holding a vial, but I should be saying, well, we'll put a nice little tree up here with a nice little spider web in it. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, I've been at the University of Cincinnati for my whole career, and I've been studying spiders uh, in a variety of areas, just as I explained by my title, in two main lines. One is in the rainforest, looking at the evolution of, of social behavior and group living in colonial orb weaving spiders. And in the other in the research lab, looking at multimodal communication and, and mate choice in wolf spiders. Now, <clears throat> the rainforest and other parts of Mexico that we worked in uh, demonstrates, you know, I was very interested at the time. This is a study, I should have to say this, it's good advice for young people. I went and started this study. I worked with Peter Witten, Wes Burgess, because I didn't believe it. I did not believe that spiders could live together. And I, I, Wes wanted me to come along as an ecologist to explain. I, I thought surely there would be an environmental explanation for it, but sociality is very rare in spiders, as you, I hope you know from lots of other people's work here in this room. But when I was in grad school, I saw this, this uh, paper by uh, someone in the audience named uh, Yael Lubin, who we wanted to know, who's that guy in Lubin? Uh, and um, uh, on Sertophora, and I thought, well, maybe it's possible. And so 
colonial web building spiders are different than the social spiders that you hear a lot about because they, they build individual webs within a colony framework and uh, they don't share prey, but they do contribute to the colony. And so we studied Metapyra and I should mention that its real name is Metapyra, but I say Metapyra because I learned it from Alan Brady, who's from Texas. So it's Metapyra. Uh, so we studied it for about 20 years in Mexico and I added up, well, I, I don't know, I got a wild hair and I added up, went through all my files, which by the way, are all in paper um, and found out that we observed spiders for 12,800 person hours. Uh, and what you see here is a distribution of the, uh, the size of colonies ranging from their solitary individuals all the way up to colonies of tens and even hundreds of thousands of spiders. Uh, it was pretty remarkable. Um, anyway, I wanted to know, this is for real, what are the fitness gains that spiders getting by living in colonies? And one of the first things we observe is called the ricochet effect, where it <laughs> sounds like a ad, the, where insects fly into the spider web and don't fly out uh, because they, they may bounce onto one web or another and end up being entangled. And this results in not an increase in prey capture rate of the spiders and uh, the, the size of the prey that are captured, but it also creates um, vibrations in the web that, that are shared information. And when we quantify this and we look at the the uh, biomass per spider per 30 minute observation as a function of colony size, you can see that over several years, the data show the same basic pattern. Uh, spiders in larger colonies get more prey biomass on a daily, on a 30 minute basis and thus on a daily basis. But also, and this is, <laughs> this is one of the more, I have to share one of the more disgusting uh, things we did is that we collected actual whole colony webs and we combed them to be free of the prey and the spiders and everything they contain, but they still smell really bad. But we weighed them and we found that per spider, the weight uh, of, of silk uh, is shared, the, the amount that they would have to contribute would, goes down. So there's some real energetic benefits to living in groups. At the same time, there are fitness costs. Um, there's competition, there's aggression, and there's increased vulnerability to uh, the predators and parasites that plague particularly tropical spiders. Uh, one of those costs is aggression, which of course has energetic costs, but you have to remember these, these spiders, these animals are heavily armed. They're dangerous. If they get, they, you get in a fight, uh, you, know, you could lose more than, than your web position, which of course you might lose your web position and the opportunity to capture prey, but it also um, it might die. Uh, but even if neither of those things happen, you may have your attention distracted and you may get parasitized in the process. And as you can see here, there, you know, as colony, of course, solitaries don't have aggressive <laughs> aggression issues. They have their own issues, of course, loneliness and abandonment. But um, they, uh, uh, you know, as the colony gets larger and larger, uh, uh, the uh, number of aggressive fights that a spider must endure uh, increase. And the other costs, and they're very important costs, uh, are, uh, are attacks by predatory wasps and uh, uh, kleptoparasitism by uh, stealth spiders. Um, uh, Linda Rayer and I and, and Craig Heber and I worked on, and we collected these data, a number of encounters uh, of, with predatory wasps as a function of colony size. Obviously, there's a big increase being in a large colony. You're going to encounter predators more often. Uh, but also you're going to have, have a number of argyrodes hanging around your web trying to steal your prey. Uh, Andrew McCrate did a master thesis on that project. And we also found among other things that argyrodes give nuptial gifts. They steal prey from a spider and go give it to, to, a, uh, to a potential mate. Uh, one of the most important fitness costs for these colonial spiders are uh, the, uh, the egg sac parasitic uh, of fly um, uh, uh, Arachnidomaya linde, and I might mention that that's named after Linda Rayer, uh, who, sent, who sent it off to, to be identified, and they, they called it linde. Um, at Craig Heber and I worked on this extensively. He was very interested in spider egg sacs um, when he was alive. And um, what we found, not only are, are there a lot of egg sacs parasitized in the larger colonies, but something very interesting was happening. And that is the behavior interaction 
between the spiders uh, and the fly. Uh, these flies are able to fly with impunity through the colony, never get caught. Uh, and at the same time, spiders are very well aware of their presence. So thanks to the people from the Sensory Ecology Symposium for, for validating my assumption that spiders can hear because there was no contact with the silk. These are fly wing beats that we tested uh, in, the, uh, in the field. Actually, Adam Porter is here somewhere and, and Adam, uh, <laughs> Adam and Beth and I uh, created this set of tapes of, of, of airborne tones that we played to spiders. And when the spiders uh, perceive a tone that is identical to the wing beat of the fly, they change their behavior completely. They run around and cover their egg sac and try to prevent the fly from, uh, from dropping a live larva on it. But if that's not enough, if the spider is able to keep the fly from getting to the to the egg sac, the fly doubles back, crawls up the, the, um, the signal thread and vibrates as if it was caught in the web. And it lures the spider off of the, the egg sac. Uh, and then the, sp and the spider realizes almost immediately that it's been had and it runs back to its egg sac and it meticulously grooms the surface uh, of the egg sac. And Craig and I found that they, they have 18 minutes before the larva can bore inside the egg sac and eat all the eggs. So it's a pretty spectacular system demonstrating ploy counterploy behavior in co-evolved predator prey interactions. There are other benefits to living in groups. One is <laughs> what uh, Bill Hamilton called the selfish herd or dilution effect, because as you, as you get larger and larger colonies, the, the individual risk and capture success of a wasp declines. But we also noticed that something else was going on at that point in time, because what, what was happening is that the spiders seemed to be forewarned of the presence of the wasp. It was like an early warning effect. And um, we wanted to find a way to test for the, you know, the, the wasp wing beat as a stimulus. So we had to create, we, had, we did not have access to the really sophisticated instruments that you saw in the sensory ecology symposium. Uh, we were in <laughs> way rural Mexico. We didn't have access to anything. We tried to find a tuning fork. It was impossible. We, we got a pitch pipe from a guitar store, but that didn't work. And there, we did have one thing, you know, but Craig Heber was able to blow into a Coke bottle and, and create a pure tone, but that only worked to mimic the flies. So what are we going to do about the wasp? Well, What, what, what is this one, Andy? What story is this one? Is this B8? <laughs> we used what we euphemistically refer to as uh, the simulated predator vibration stimulus, also known as a marital aid, and uh, among other things. And we attacked spiders with this device uh, in a sequential manner. And as you can see, while the first spider is attacked, uh, latency to respond is slow. The other ones respond ever so quickly after that. So clearly there's vibration and shared information that is causing those spiders to get out of the way. And this is one of those things. <laughs> it's like one of those studies that uh, for which, uh, well, it's legendary. A lot of people know about it. People ask me about it all the time. Um, Linda and, and Beth, both here and you know well, uh, were involved in my in an NSF project um, where Linda and I were were very interested in what's what trade-offs structure a colony. We found that these colonies are not randomly organized. That if you look at them, you find that on the edge of the colony, at the distance from the center, most of the spiders are small. Where in the center of the colony, you have a lot of larger spiders, particularly uh, egg egg laying females. And in between, you have a, a, a mix of body sizes. And what we found out is that these spiders are dealing with a trade-off between prey capture opportunity and on the one hand and risk of predation on the other. And so if you look at the amount of prey that spiders get, it's not only distributed unevenly within the colony, the periphery having the largest amount of prey and the core less, uh, but Different spiders of different sizes get more. That's where the aggression thing comes in. They can, the big, the big ones in the middle can go out and beat up the little ones and take their food. 
but we also found that risk is not evenly distributed. Uh, it's greatest on the periphery and greatest for the small spiders or the occasional larger spider on the periphery. So this balance uh, of, uh, of benefits and costs uh, living in the selfish herd is something that, that we focused on in our research. And uh, it's a real balancing act. Colonial web building is different than social uh, web building spiders. And so uh, we, I think we learned a great deal about it. Uh, unfortunately, we had to discontinue our research in Mexico uh, on, a, on account of the, the of danger. Uh, and, uh, but uh, as, as Madonna has so aptly said, don't cry for me, Argentina, because we're still working on Metapyra just somewhere else. Uh, what we found is that I was, I used to visit, I still visit California and the uh, Monterey Peninsula. My wife was a university ombudsman and they had their conferences there. So I tagged along because it's so beautiful. Surprise, surprise. I found uh, Metapyra uh, colonies on the coast of California. And I found that they, they uh, uh, vary in their tendency to be colonial as a function of El Nino cycles. So I've had a 20 year study since leaving Mexico and going to California with these colleagues, um, only one of whom is here and is your president. But uh, we have clearly found a pattern associated with the El Nino phenomenon. During El Nino years, it's very wet, as you can see by this cute little diagram here. And uh, that, that makes the vegetation more lush. It brings in more prey and the spiders get fat and they lay more eggs. And then the next year, which is a La Nina year, a little drier, there are a lot more spiders and the colonies are larger. And you have this cyclical relationship from El Nino and La Nina back and forth to have lots more colonies or, or more spiders per colony, colony size gets larger. And we compared um, two areas, Monterey Peninsula and Half Moon Bay, uh, and they show the same pattern. Uh, and, and we have uh, places that are, um, that are um, mesic and, and wet and places that are dry in both of these locations. And uh, the dry places seem to suffer more, but even in El Nino years, they, they get more spiders. So Metapyra is still out there. We're still working on it. I've had a sabbatical this year uh, with one of my goals is to work up all these data, but I, I'm not quite finished yet. So on to the research lab, which, Consumes, has consumed a lot of my time. Someone, someone asked me once, well, you know, you're having such a great time in Mexico in the summer, uh, you know, well, you have to do something the rest of the school year and have all these students who aren't going to go to Mexico. Some did, but not all. So um, we happen to have a local project and a local species that we could work on. And um, I, I like to say that my, my career as a behavioral ecologist or an animal behaviorist is really accidental. Uh, you know, I, I owe my, well, I owe a lot of my career and life to serendipity. Uh, but uh, when I was in grad school, I was studying lots and lots of spiders and leaf litter. And, and one of those was um, uh, this spider here. Now, back in the day, you got to remember, there was no DNA analysis. There was no barcoding. There was no genomic you know, you identified species by actually looking at their genitalia. And I know there are people here who actually have seen spider naughty parts. Um, but what we found with this species of spider, uh, and we keyed it out. These are the male and female genitalia. And in all the books I had access to, they were pointing to this species here, Schizocosa ocreata. These are clearly Schizocosa. But as you notice, Ocreata is well known for the tufts of bristles on, on the adult male. And this species does not have them. So having moved to Ohio and was looking for undergraduate projects, Jerry Robner suggested, well, you know, he had some Schizocosa Ocreata that did not have tufts. And he found that they had parasites that were uh, literally castrating them, pushing up against the uh, of uh, the sex organs, uh, the gonads, and and um, uh, suppressing the secondary sex characters. So I had an undergrad student named Jerry Dennerline, um, and she was uh, looking for a project. And so I had her dissect, so I had her 
we got some micro dissection tools. I had her dissect 100 of my wolf spider specimens to see if they had parasites. And no, they did not. And we thought, hmm. So um, we went out to where Jerry studied his Schizocosa ogreata in eastern Ohio. And we went back to Illinois to collect spiders from my study site. And we brought them both in the lab. And we put them together to see if they paid any attention to each other. And what we found, and that, that later became Gail Stratton's doctoral thesis, was that these are different species. They uh, have very different behavior. Uh, if you look at the behavior of Schizocosa ogreata here and listen to the sound it makes, it's a very active courtship that involves a lot of complex sounds and vibrations and a lot of complex body movements. And uh, um, when we went to visit Jerry and, and when this project started, Jerry had a collection of pornographic spider movies that he he wanted to show me, and that's how I knew what their courtship looked like. So when I, I got in the lab, and Jerry Dennerlein and I, and then later Gail and I, uh, looked at the courtship of this species, it's much more brief and to the point, and uh, very, very different. And I knew immediately we had uh, what's called at the time cryptic species, or uh, as the uh, as the Europeans called it, etho species, where it's the they're reproductively isolated by their their courtship behavior. And the data collected here in the middle between between Gail and I shows that males male spiders will court conspecifics and heterospecifics with equal frequency, but females are much more discerning. Um, and the argument we make for these, these couple of females here is that they had too many margaritas, but they, um, uh, it's real clear that there is uh, a, a, a reproductive barrier between these two species populations. And, uh, and we, we named, I named the, uh, this species uh, Schizocosa rovner after Jerry Rovner. So after that, we began to work on the brush-legged wolf spider, because a number of people brought to my attention that, well, you know, sexual selection as an area of research was beginning to catch fire. And, and uh, this was a great species to, to look at uh, because it, it, it has both visual and vibratory signaling in the male uh, and they're very conspicuous visual traits. Uh, and they produce not very loud signals. I mean, if you get really, really close and it's really, really quiet, you might be able to hear them, as opposed to rodent rye, which you can hear in the woods. Um, and um, we learned, and we will, I'll tell you about it in a minute, there's evidence for female mate choice. And, they're, and they also live in this complex environment, hearkening back to my doctoral thesis. Leaf litter is a very complex environment, and there are constraints on... Uh, sight and sound. And uh, so there, we were interested in whether multimodal communication served the function as a redundant or backup signal. The vibratory signals are produced. Jerry Rodner had discovered in 1975, he discovered that there was a stridulatory organ in the palps of wolf spiders right at this first joint. And it produces this, this vibratory signal. Uh, and uh, that's for, for um, ocreata is composed of both percussion and stridulation. So you've got these little pulses of scritchy, scratchy noise and these booms of, of leg, uh, both leg tapping and abdomen tapping on the uh, substrate. So this is a fairly complex a set of vibratory seismic signals or seismic vibratory signals, however you want to say it. And, um, but they also have these very complicated visual signals. Uh, the spiders are... Uh, always moving around and they're always tapping their legs. They have a behavior we call jerky tapping uh, where they tap and move their body in a jerky fashion at the same time. And sometimes they stop and they wave and arch and show off those uh, tufts of bristles on their forelegs. And as far as we know, those tufts of bristles um, have no sensory function. They're just decorative, uh, but they're very conspicuous secondary sexual characteristics. But we also find that, that they turn out to be condition indicating traits. So we began with one of my students, Dr. Eileen Hebbets, uh, to study uh, Ocreate and Rovneri 
and then other species in the genus by looking at when you have multiple signals being produced, how do the females respond? Uh, do they, how do they respond to isolated visual cues, isolated vibratory cues or multimodal cues? And this is a really sophisticated uh, uh, apparatus. As you can see, we've got spiders in clear plastic boxes on different foam blocks and on the same substrate with a piece of cardboard between them. So, you know, we, we've gotten more sophisticated since then, but this is how that study began. And what you can see here comparing oak rate and rover eye is that uh, multimodal signals and vibration signals get responses from both uh, uh, females of both species. But when it comes to visual cues, much more response from uh, uh, oak rata than rover eye. They're, 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 rover eye tend to be uh, vibratory specialists while while Ocarita tend to be multimodal. And we wanted to look across the genus and we got a, a bunch of the species that we could find in, in collaboration with Gale down in Mississippi. And we tested them all the same way. And they have been tested since then in a number of ways. And we find that across the genus that we were able to survey, there are real differences. Some are vibratory specialists, that's all they respond to. Uh, and others uh, ha have uh, visual and vibratory signaling. Now, Eileen uh, has, has turned this into a franchise. Uh, she's done an incredible uh, set of studies looking at the vibratory signals, the visual signals, the responses of females, the decorations on the male legs, and a whole lot of others. And she's got she's collaborating with, with Jason Bond on looking at the phylogeny. And they've come to understand that there are two things you can say. One is that either and it doesn't have to be either or, but uh, decorations and visual communication have evolved independently several times, or they have been secondarily lost. And data at the moment are leaning towards that second hypothesis. There, uh, the the uh, some of the basal groups have tufts and visual leg decorations and visual cues, uh, and then other uh, more derived species have lost those uh, those capacities. Um, at the same time, working with someone else who's in the audience, uh, Matt Persons, um, people ask me, you know, what, what do you do? You study spiders, you know, spider sex, you know, it's like, well, basically it's in spring, my students and I go out to the woods and we collect a bunch of spiders and we arrange their marriages. And so that's what Matt decided to do in this project. And we, we got 120 pairs and put them in mesocosms of leaf litter in the lab to see what, what happened. And what happens right off is the female takes a swipe at the male uh, and, and you know approaches him and lunges at him most of the time. And some of those lunges uh, are deadly in that the females cannibalize the male and they don't even copulate with them. So it's like out of the gene pool. <clears throat> and um, then we have others and a large portion of them go on and, and get mated and some don't. And then after a night together, um, she may eat them or not. And what we found out uh, and, and published in 2005 is that at every junction here, what happens, the yes, no question is determined by the characteristics of the male, the size of his tufts, the symmetry of his tufts, his body condition, a vigor of his courtship, all of those things are important in this chain of events that is mating for Schizocosa ocreata. So this is summarizing <laughs> the following decade or more of work by lots of people, uh, but male traits and behaviors, tufts, the amplitude of vibration, the vigor of their courtship, all of these things vary with the size of the male, with his weight, with his experience, nutrition, prey capture, and his overall health and, uh, and body condition. And as you can see from some of these graphs, this is from a paper, a review paper that a number of us did. Um, uh, tuft size is a preference function here. Female receptivity increases with tuft size. Female uh, receptivity increases with the amplitude uh, and uh, size of the two things together or the amplitude of vibration by itself. So all these male traits and male behavioral characteristics factor into whether they get mated or not. And this is a study uh, that some undergrad students did that, uh, that showed that 
depending on feeding history, uh, males uh, that are well fed have uh, larger tufts, regardless of the, the, their given size, than those that are that are poorly fed. In that same milieu, like I said, I owe my career to ser serendipity. We had an, a really fortuitous, albeit accidental, study. Uh, my uh, my colleague up there in the corner, Dave Clark, um, here with his first mustache uh, and and hair. Um, sorry, Dave. And made a phenomenal discovery with jumping spiders, which we then parlayed to a, a, a work with wolf spiders. And that discovery was video playback. We were able to digitize spiders and um, play them back on tiny little screens. Uh, and we, so we discovered video playback. It was at, at the time quite revolutionary, but the important thing that I saw in one of my, my uh, fever dreams was that we could do stuff experimentally. We could control for behavior and change appearance. We could control for appearance and change behavior. We could manipulate size. We can manipulate tufts. We could change the background. Uh, we could do lots of things while holding other things constant. And that's very important in experimental science to answer, isolate and answer specific questions. To, okay. Oh, there we go. And the first thing we tackled with Will McClintock was tuft size. We had not only a range of live spiders where we separated them out into the, the uh, smallest third, the largest third, and the in-between, but also with Sony Sheffer, we shaved off the, uh, the tufts of males. Uh, and then we did the same with video. And the pattern that we find here is really quite clear. So, you know, we realized that by shaving tufts off or by trying to give them a trim, you try to give a spider a haircut, not an easy thing, uh, you know, but when you manipulate live spiders and then you, you put them there and you, you may or may not get a response from the female, you don't know whether that response is due to something you did that injured the spider while you're giving it a haircut. And so video allows us to hold everything constant, the behavior, the size, uh, everything about it and manipulate one thing and that's the size of the tufts and that's what we've got going on here. Um, so this is a so proof of the pudding with um, with tuft size. Uh, we've fast forward to the present day, we're now able to combine a sight and sound, if you will. We have uh, disc benders, piezoelectric disc benders with which we can play back uh, spider vibrations uh, and we can even do um, choice tests where we give females choice between combinations of visual and uh, multimodal signals or seismic and multimodal signals. And what you can see here is that given a choice, females prefer the multimodal signal over an isolated visual or, or an isolated seismic signal. And that figures in fa fairly important in, uh, in some other work we've done. We also wanted to take this to the field because these guys live in complex leaf litter and we wanted to see how far their, their uh, signals travel in nature. Um, and we, we measured uh, with this uh, device called a laser vibrometer. Uh, we were out in the field and measured the distance uh, at which we could find a vanishing point for the seismic signals uh, and uh, determined that by the curve you can see here. And then we, we, uh, Andy Roberts, I say, we, Andy Roberts invented this really interesting combination laser pointer um, distance measure to, to look at how far it is from a point that spider would be to the first visual obstruction. And that gives us the, the, that, that visual signal curve. But we'd also tested in the lab, the visual range of the females, which is greater than any of these, because you realize, hmm, there's a danger zone. Thinking from an evolutionary sense, we know from the phylogenies and the things that, that Eileen has shown that um, seismic vibratory signals are plesiomorphic for wolf spiders. And so the visual cues and the decorations are added on, they're the derived characteristics. And so adding on visual to make a signal multimodal deals with this, whoops, danger zone. Well, I'll tell you, here's how the story works. Here's a female. 
or as a male, courting at the least complex leaf litter. And here's the range of his seismic signals. Here's the range of female spider visual detection. If, he, if he's signaling his heart out and he's only making vibrations and there's no visual cues or visual courtship signals, the female will see him and potentially eat him. But if she can see him and hear him, she may mate with him. So selection favors multimodal signals because they overcome the constraints of the physical environment. But they're also overt signals and their spiders are not alone. Among other things, there are other male wolf spiders listening in, we call them social eavesdroppers because they, they, they listen in in an attempt to steal their, the other guy's date. Um, but we also have other eavesdroppers out there called interceptive eavesdroppers, which just detect the signal of a potential prey item. So the eavesdropping became an important direction in our research. And it's one of those stories, Andy Roberts and Dave Clark and I worked on this and we, 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 we saw it happen in the field. Uh, and then we tried to, to, to study it in the lab and we got no difference uh, in um, uh, courting and walking, no, no difference at all. Uh, but in field collected spiders, we got a lot of responses where males start courtship as soon as they see another courting male, but not in the lab. And where's what a head slapping? Field spiders get to see all this mating activity all around them while you know in the lab, they haven't even seen another spider. So th there must be a learning component here. And we knew that, that wolf spiders could learn. My former student, uh, Casey Kashner had done a master's demonstrating that schizocosa can learn uh, toxic prey and avoid them. So we did a lab study where we paired a, a live focal male with uh, according male stimulus on video, along with um, stimuli indicating a female was nearby. We had female cues on a, a, on a, 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 a filter paper disc, and we had a live female in the arena. And then we had another set where there was a video playback stimulus and there was no female cues. And then we had spiders that were uh, raised with no experience at all. And the result is very clear. Um, those that were conditioned with male video and female cues learned to eavesdrop. And those that didn't, did not. So we found several things that, the, that while courtship in response to female uh, chemical cues is innate, at the same time, courtship in response to other males is learned. And so we've done a number of studies about that. Um, we, we can also train them to eavesdrop, which is really great. Uh, Brent Stouffer, one of my uh, former grad students and current colleague at UC uh, is um, uh, found following up Eileen's work that um, uh, female spiders learn from the eavesdropping too. And their exposure to males, uh, either as juveniles or as adults, uh, can uh, affect their ultimate mate choice, either the size of the tufts of the male they're exposed to or the number of males they're exposed to all affect their sensory uh, pre preference as adults. But then there's this, and I always have to show this because everybody loves this video. Part of Andy Roberts' doctoral thesis was looking at, he was looking at eavesdropping uh, and uh, the cost of courtship behavior. And we knew that uh, toads eat schizocosa. <laughs> everybody loves that, so I have to show it. But basically um, they readily accept schizocosa as prey. We fed them to them. And we also have, have analyzed the stomach contents of a number of toads and found tufted forelegs in them. So we know they eat them in nature. Uh, so we tested uh, video images of prey capturing behavior and we were interested in uh, the role of the tufts. And if you, if you look here, uh, what you see is that uh, uh, the percentage of toads that attack the video stimulus is uh, completely dependent on the presence of the tuft. Tuft really, really makes the, the prey item more visible. And so eavesdropping on, on a cue reading on the part of these, uh, of these uh, predators is important. We also tested this with birds who putatively have the best, best vision 
uh, of, among the spider predators, except for those eagle-eyed spider collectors who go out at night with headlamps. But um, Ann Lori did a thesis, and <laughs> another. She did a thesis, and she found that she was studying impact of birds on spiders and leaf litter. And indeed, if you if you can exclude birds from patches of leaf litter, the spiders survive much better. But uh, she also found, and Dave Clark found this out uh, in, in an experiment, is that spiders respond to bird calls. Not all bird calls, but predatory birds like blue jays and finches and cardinals, which are their natural predators, they respond to their calls, their airborne calls, with uh, a behavior we call freeze. Uh, they stop courtship immediately and remain motionless for, for some period of time. And uh, I should thank again, the people from the Sensory Ecology Symposium for validating my notion that spiders can hear because this work was greatly criticized because spiders have no tympanic membranes and responding to acoustic stimuli would be, you know, a mistake of some kind. But what we found out is that we could compare what's really happening is that the, the vibration of, or the, the acoustic cue is being translated onto a substratum vibratory cue by the paper that the spiders are on. So we extended this, Dave Clark and Trisha Ruby and I, Trisha Ruby is a queen of blue jays, she had a captive colony of blue jays and we, Dave made a video of spiders. Some of them were leaf litter colored, some of them naturally colored uh, and uh, uh, put them as courting, walking and freezing against a background. And as you can see here, while you know, courting spiders get picked off, that we, I should add that these are trained blue jays. This is an operant conditioning model where, where the blue jays are trained to recognize spiders on video in leaf litter and given a reward if they if they attack. So that's pretty good reinforcement, typical of bird behavior. But what you see here is that they're a little bit different for walking behavior if the, if the spider matches the background. So there's a camouflage effect. But importantly, when they freeze, there's almost no response at all from the birds. So this behavior that, that, that Ann pointed out in her master's work is clearly adaptive anti-predator behavior. Now we'll move on to the new and unpublished insights. We, we had earlier in our eavesdropping studies uh, shown that, that uh, Ocreatum uh, use signal matching. When they see a male courting, they adjust their courtship rate to match their rivals. Uh, most recently, I had a student who, who found that the eavesdropping males also recognize differences in tuft size between themselves and the rivals. This suggests a cognitive ability on the part of these spiders because if the, if the stimulus spider tuft size is equal to that of the focal live spider, you have the highest rate of aggression. If the focal is, is, focal is larger than the, than the stimulus, uh, it, it, uh, it taps less and when the focal spider is smaller than the um, than the the stimulus spider it increases its um let me go back here sorry. it increases its courtship rate after eavesdropping suggesting what some variant of what we call the desperado effect but clearly they have the capability to assess their rival relative to their own self how that works i don't know um another unpublished study we're trying uh, with uh, Alex Swieger and, and some other students has to do with the effects of leaf moisture on vibratory communication. Uh, we've uh, been looking at uh, um, uh, the, the signals on dry versus wet leaves as a function of distance over the leaf. And we've also looked at the frequency uh, of spiders at the source of the recording or the, the uh, 10 centimeters away. Clearly there's a difference in wet versus dry leaves in um, uh, transmitting vibration. That also transfers over to the vibration uh, from an acoustic bird call. Manny Bagaroff did a study where he looked at, at the um, at blue jay calls and, and found that the percent of freeze responses are much greater on dry leaves than wet leaves because wet leaves dampen sound. And uh, uh, the, the length of time they spend in a freeze posture is much longer as well. And the, the cumulative number of, 
of males returning to courtship on a dry leaf versus a wet leaf is very different. So clearly leaf wetness, which in the Midwest in the spring, it's getting wetter and wetter uh, with climate change is affecting spider communication. We also looked at visual communication. Dave Clark and I have a, a manuscript in review right now where we, we create a stimuli of spiders of natural color and spiders that are no color at all, they're gray, or spiders that are average color, uh, they're made to resemble the background. And we play them against three different backgrounds or two different backgrounds, a control background, the digital leaf litter and plants and a, a gray background. And we looked at the response of intended receivers, females, uh, their ability to detect and their ability to recognize detection based on orientation latency, recognition based on receptivity. And clearly the naturally colored spider um, is detected very quickly, but so against the uh, complex color litter, so is the, uh, the, the, the uh, average color spider, but not the gray spider. And likewise, this is just the opposite. They get more receptivity. It's a flip-flop of the other side. Against a grayscale litter background, the responses are different. If you compare those responses to eavesdropping schizocosa, you get different responses. And this tells us that there may be some difference in color perception on the part of males and female spiders uh, or their ability to detect spiders against the background may be dependent on either intensity contrast or chromatic contrast. We tested this with other eavesdroppers like predatory rabidosa and phytopus, as well as toads, and found that while their responses took longer, their responses were similar and different at the same time. And so across this, not to belabor it, but across, here's, here's one of these, gee, we tested the hypothesis that different animals see colors and contrast differently. Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. uh, ho, you know, that was a good hypothesis, wasn't it? Um, but uh, these animals see color differently. We continue to work on work I'm, some of you have, have heard with immune function started by Rachel Gilbert. And the short version is that we, if spiders are infected with pathogens. They develop smaller, less symmetrical tufts. They have reduced vibration signals. They can transfer those infections during copulation as STDs. And females can detect infected males by chemical cues. And my current graduate student, Olivia bauer Nilsson is following this up. But the important finding she is, because she's looking from the female perspective, not the male perspective. We're always interested in how does being infected affect males and their ability to court? Well, how does it affect females? And it turns out males are females. Infection has nothing to do with their mating success, but what it does affect is female behavior. And if you look at the females that didn't mate, they were more resistant and more aggressive towards infected males. They clearly recognize them and they clearly are more aggressive in their behavior toward them. So females, the discriminating sex in Schizocosa ocreata, as we know, uh, are able to discern the health of the male that they may or may not mate with. The latest research, which will be presented by Olivia at 1045, uh, has to do with uh, uh, our, our newest love, um, uh, Schizocosa saltatrix, which we are very attracted to because of the vibration it creates. It's a pretty interesting complex sound, but it's accompanied by visual cues. And you hear more about that at 1045. Okay, so what's next here? So what do we learn? Well, and this was all important when I was growing up, we're building the database of biodiversity. We're understanding the natural world and we've gained insights into social behavior of spiders in an atypically social animal and insight into communication. Um, We've also developed with Dave Clark a method, a novel method for experimental study of behavior that's used by many others with everything from cephalopods to praying mantises. And uh, spider behaviors, way more complex than I ever would have thought. They have cognitive abilities beyond what, what I thought they ever had. And uh, that makes them great models for uh, research. 
All that said, Linda wanted me to comment on the Archaeological Society, in which I realize I have been a member of the Archaeological Society for 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> and on the website, you'll see this photograph of uh, the big gathering in 1975 uh, in Warrensburg, Missouri. And um, the guy in the striped shirt is me. I was into rugby shirts at the time. But there are two other people. And strangely, and if you ask me to and give me a quiz, I can identify at least half of the people in this photograph. Um, there's Peter Witt, who got me started going to Mexico and studying colonial spiders. And there's Jerry Roger who got me started studying wolf spiders. So these people are very important. So I've been to a lot of, since I've been a member for 50 years, I've been to a lot of arachnology meetings. And some of you who have been hosts, you see your logos up there, um, which is a good thing. Uh, not surprised, <laughs> but here's the amazing thing, because I never throw anything out. I have all my programs. And so what that is, is a data source. This tells me that attendance has been increasing over the years. Uh, it Yes, it's very high when you have a joint meeting of the Archaeological Society, American Archaeological Society and the International Society and the International Congress. Uh, but we had the largest attendance at the virtual meeting uh, two years ago. And um, since the very early beginning in Portal, Arizona in 1972, and the meeting I went to in New York in 1967, this society has grown and the the uh, the number of attendees and the number of presentations are significantly different between the centuries i'm sorry i tell my students so uh, i'm i'm a visitor from an earlier century um but it's really clear that uh, uh arachnology is ascendant as a as a subdiscipline of biological sciences and our attendance and presentations at these meetings, which I know have all been great so far, uh, attest. Uh, and if you look at the topics, uh, at the very beginning, it was sort of even between systematics and ecology. And then for, for, for the 90s, ecology predominated, and then it has gone the other way. Uh, systematics and functional uh, biology, uh, integrative biology, physiology of spiders is increasing dramatically in this century. I did a, a, a review in 2016, uh, looking just at spider behavior papers and looking specifically at communication. And from the earliest, um, from the earliest publications in the 60s by Jerry Rodner, by the way, um, we have had a great increase in spider communication, uh, lycosity in particular, and schizocosa within that genus, no surprise. Uh, family, no surprise. So here's the puncification part. Any spider can be a model species because everything we do is new to science. When I started out, you know, I published a paper on spiders on leaves. You know, it was a novel finding. You know, different spiders live on different leaves. We didn't know this before. And so everything you do, whether you're a student or an established researcher, is going to be new to science. And what, how this field has grown is just staggering from the viewpoint of an old guy who's been here since the beginning. Um, but we have all these great model organisms now, and we should build on them. It's a growing list. Because Krogh's principle, something you hear about from time to time, for every biological question, there is a species uniquely uh, positioned to provide the answer. Never underestimate the importance of random discoveries. You could see that often in my career. Uh, side projects can be hum become whole new lines of research. New questions can bring new insights. And there's always change in your, in your research career. Technology is something that I've observed. You know, I, was I talking? Oh, I was talking to uh, uh, Sarah Stilweg the other day. But I was like, yeah, we, we had newspapers. We had, um, you know, paper files and stuff like that. Things change. Be careful what rabbit hole you dive into. The technology is really powerful, but you can really get subsumed with the technology to the exclusion of the question. Um, and statistics, which I've noticed, have become way more complicated than they ever were, but they don't have to be complex to provide the answers. 
there's also very trendiness. I mean, I've noticed these trends in my own career starting out. I was, you know, I was discouraged from pursuing biodiversity uh, as, as a topic. And then, you know, 30 years later, E.O. Wilson came along, coined the term, and it became a hot topic again. Um, you don't have to be a fashionista to do good science, just do good science. And don't forget you have a home here. Um, we all get jobs in different areas of biology, whether you're hired to teach anatomy and physiology to nurses, or you're hired to be an invertebrate zoologist as I was, but there are very few positions that say, I want an arachnologist. You know, we want somebody who's going to get grants in physiology or get grants in animal behavior. And so that's your primary discipline, but never forget you study spiders and you always have a home here because the Archaeological Society, to, to my mind, has always been a very welcoming and inclusive scientific community. And I should acknowledge my colleagues on these two projects. Um, these are all the people who have worked on the Mexico and California projects uh, and the funding from NSF and National Geographic. And uh, the Schizocosa projects are a little <laughs> more people have been involved with them. And I should also give a shout out that we work on lands occupied by the native people in Mexico, the Totonacs, and in, in, in Ohio, the Mia Mia and the Shawandasi, or the Miami and Shawnee. Uh, but I should also give this shout out, which is the one common <laughs> denominator between these two slides, which yeah. is. Kitty, my wife, who was the den mother to the Utz lab and has played a large role. So we go from the upper corner here with Jerry Dennerline and Gail Stratton all the way down to the lower right corner with the Utz lab at, 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 the, at the cookout uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge my, my mentors, only two of whom are left alive. Uh, and uh, without them, I would not at all uh, be where I am today. So with that, I'll drop the mic and take any questions you might have. Thank you. Wow, you, you honor me beyond my capacity to express myself, almost. <laughs> any, any questions up here? Oh, wait, where, 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 there, I saw one there and we saw one over here first. Okay, Mercedes. I love the talks that mix advice and uh, a, a lot of interesting research. And one thing that I hadn't thought of that you brought up was that the modalities or uh, the sensory modalities and the capacities between males and females in schizocosa could be different. Do you know of other systems where males and females differ in their visual capability or uh, acoustic um, capabilities? Well, that's a real interesting question. She asked whether there were other spiders where males and females might differ in their sensory abilities. And we did see in the sensory symposium, we, there was one, one example, but it, it, to be honest, we tend to sort of get tunnel vision. We study vibration or we study visual cues and we don't necessarily Cross collaborate. One of the places where things are really happening right now, uh, Damian Elias uh, is working on uh, now on vibration with Andy Mason. He's working with vibration in jumping spiders, which have been extensively studied for visual cues. But now we're realizing that vibratory cues may, may in some species be important and others un, not important at all. Within Schizocosa, we see real differences between, be, between female responses. And, and male uh, capabilities. As far as the physiological, that's not my wheelhouse, but it would not at all surprise me to have different uh, spectral frequencies of the retina of different species or different sexes. 
as well as different species. And there'd spiders. be really big trade-offs with those because. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a light dark thing. The combination of natural and sexual selection yep. is going to drive for different yep. sort of specialities. If I may, I want to ask one more question. Oh boy, okay. Um, so there's, I'm an early career scientist. There's other early career scientists here. Um, it, it doesn't um, escape my notice that um, you've mentored so many uh, researchers who are still in this community and others who've had your, uh, you know, same similar, I guess, illustrious career. Maybe you've had mentees that have gone off to other fields. Um, why do you think so many of your former students have stayed in arachnology? Well, I mean, they, they came to it. You know, I think everything has to be in context. There was a time where there were very few places you could do graduate study in arachnology. Thankfully, that's no longer true. But when I, I remember when I finished my degree and got my first job, I was invited to a dinner at Peter Witt's house and he was celebrating the fact that now there were four places you could get a PhD in arachnology. Peter, Susan Riker, Jerry Rover, and me. And uh, since then, see the list on the Archaeological Society, there's a lot more. Uh, our society I, is growing. And I think, you know, students came to me at the, at the time because they were already interested in spiders. Uh, some came because they were interested in multimodal communication, but uh, others came to me because they, they were budding arachnologists and they stayed with it. Um, I don't know, you know, I have noticed and, and, and I'm, I realize who I'm talking to here, but the, the, the growth in numbers is not um, evenly divided between the sexes. We have a lot more young female arachnologists and beginning to be established female arachnologists than who are. It was a male dominated field up until Susan Reichert came along. And so, uh, you know, I think there's a certain element of machismo in there. Uh, yeah, young women wanting to study spiders because they can. But uh, it's, uh, you know, one has to also be encouraging, and I hope that I've been encouraging to my students. Cool. Yeah, I want to go back to multimodal uh, courtship in the in the field and ask about what you know about uh, detour and route navigation. So the substrate vibration, yeah. The substrate vibration can go through whatever circuitous path the leaves make contact, but the vision is by line of sight. And there's a, a lot of work on uh, salticids when they're faced with that problem that the vision goes away. But what do you know about this? The Whether the female or the male moves towards each other, they could still be getting the vibratory communication, but they might lose the line of sight. What happens then? Well, I, I think that's a real good point. Um, uh, within the complex environment, we know that the, the um, vibratory signals generally only go to the, to the, to the leaf unless two leaves, leaves are in contact. And even if they are, that signal attenuates and plummets. So the distance over which vibration can be perceived is a visual entirely based on line of sight, like you said. Um, and I, the males will do, males are responding primarily to chemical cues while females are responding primarily to visual and vibratory cues. So, so the detour, females don't, they move towards males, but they don't move anywhere near as much as males do. Males will circle females, males will approach directly. And um, it's very difficult to study in the field because what these particular spiders like to do is to go under the leaves because they like their privacy when they mate. And uh, so I, I, no one that I know has studied detour behavior in the same way that Jackson and others have studied this in, in salticids. But it's certainly, among well, young people, a great area of research in the future. I wanted to ask, um, is it possible or have you seen a female conditioned uh, to such large, magnificent tufts that they no longer respond to the tufts of a normal male. Oh, that's great. Do, do females, do they essentially uh, uh, either habituate or, or are they stimulated to a point they ignore everything less than a great? We did have 
but the, the single experience of Don Juan, uh, who was one of our subjects who every female adored. And um, he had the largest tufts, the largest tuft to body size ratio he had. And I thought, wow, this is a really a very nice looking guy. And uh, then we let him court and he was magnificent. <laughs> so I'm sure that that figures into it. Whether females will, you know, reach some kind of saturation point uh, is not clear. They do and can, they can and do change their behavior with exposure. Uh, we just found this out in my, my student, uh, uh, Alenka Taimash's paper with, with the Saltatrix. We found counter to our expectations that, that uh, females that were exposed to males longer uh, showed less response. Uh, in, in the other studies we've done and that Eileen has, has done, female spiders exposed to males of one kind or another are more likely to mate with that. But I haven't seen a threshold response where suddenly, uh, you know, you, you, it, it, but what may be built in is that the males have to exceed a threshold to get mated. And, you know, anything above that threshold is acceptable, below that threshold isn't. And there may be a good explanation for that. So, Doug? Thanks so much. That was awesome. Just fantastic. Um, any evidence that uh, they're hearing uh, beyond the seismic vibration? I saw, I guess it was Eileen's study. They were on, uh, they were isolated, but they were in boxes. Um, is there no airborne communication? Well, beyond? Mm -hmm. this is a continuing debate because one of the problems we have is that all the ways we corral spiders create vibration transfer from airborne sounds. But, and when you're working with web building spiders, like flies, we had a great technique called fly on a stick. Um, we tried wasp on a stick, but we found out they would sting. Um, but fly on a stick, you could take a, a house fly or you could take an arachnidomyia linda and you, you could hold it in the air near a spider and they would respond. So the, what they're, are, are they responding with a trichobothria? I don't know, we didn't have any, uh, electrophysiology probes in the field. Uh, but um, uh, I, I'm convinced that there are, and in fact, your student, you had a student, we were in your lab recording uh, schizocosal legs to airborne cues and, and the, the slits in Sully were, were firing. So I, you know, and Ron Hoy and, and uh, Eileen and Andy Mason and, 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 uh, uh, and Damien have all shown that there are some responses to airborne sound. And it may it may well be what they were talking about in the, uh, the sensory ecology symposium. Our guys, pretty much the vibration is being transferred, and it's not something you can easily eliminate. With Eileen and I will put them on granite so they 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 can't hear substrate vibration or feel substrate vibration, but they may still respond to airborne. Now, schizocosa do not. I mean, if we put them on on granite, they don't respond to airborne cues, but Matt Persons has done some work with Gladicosa that suggests they do respond to acoustic signals of other males. So it may vary among the genera. I mean, there's nothing coming emanating from the leaf. What frequencies are we in? We're really high frequency, aren't we? Well, like it's way beyond it's our a, own. It's a it's a spread. Uh, the, the main signal is running from about sixty hertz up to about twelve hundred. Uh, then it drops off precipitously, but as we were just talking to, to Dave about Mavia, there's a blip on the end that we realize we haven't put the <laughs> we haven't we haven't put the sensitivity out further, and that curve may come back up, and we didn't know about it. So there may be higher frequencies. Stim Wilcox, who worked with me for a while, uh, argued that uh, spiders had the potential to respond to much higher frequencies. That we know they respond to the high frequencies of blue jays and other birds. I mean, they're in the in the five five to 10 kHz range. And so they, they recognize those and respond to them. So have I gone over my limit here? The young lady over there I saw. <laughs> well, that's going to be a... Thank you, Becca. That's very nice. about the males learning from each other 
Um, was there certain aspects of their signal, whether like auditory or visual, that they learned and would compete with more? Or like, are they, is it even likely that they would be within that close range of their visual field to learn visually from another male? Well, they, they would. In nature, what happens when there is a female and she's giving off chemical cues, there, it's not uncommon for two or three males to be within 10 centimeters of that female. Um, in in the, the one study that my student did, clearly, and that was within like a 10 centimeter range, and there was no vibration involved, it was all visual cues. And they can tell the difference, the relative size difference of their opponent's tufts and their own. How they know that, I don't know. But they, you know, spiders clearly behave as if they know the difference. So, that, you know, having demonstrated that, we then have to ask the question of how and even or why they might be doing that. But they, they clearly, uh, males will respond to visual cues of other males. Uh, they also respond to vibratory cues of other males in isolation. So they, all those things are happening. Thank you.